Okay, we're going to cover arteries of the neck and answer the questions, what major arteries are found in the neck and what tissues and organs do they supply? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So here are all the arteries of the neck that we're going to be covering and we'll start with the subclavian arteries and its branches. So the subclavian artery is asymmetrical in its origin, meaning the two arteries have different origins. One's in the brachiocephalic trunk, right, and one from the aortic arch left. Let's do that again with these pictures. We zoom in. So the right subclavian artery arises from the brachiocephalic trunk. There's the aortic arch, brachiocephalic trunk, and there's our right subclavian artery. The left subclavian artery comes from the aortic arch. There's the aortic arch. There's the left subclavian artery. So there's these the, showing the asymmetrical origins of both subclavian arteries. So subclavian artery branches are as follows. The first one is the vertebral artery. This is a, a very important one. And so in this lateral view, you see the subclavian artery and there's our vertebral artery there ascending and it gets close and uh, going up and hitting those transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae. Now, here's our vertebral artery coming right off the subclavian and as it comes up, it hits the apex between in this triangle between the anterior scalene and longus coli muscles. That's the vertebral triangle right there that apex is where the vertebral artery enters the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae like that. And there's those transverse foramina as it sends up through the neck. And so in the superior view of the cervical vertebrae in blue is the transverse foramina and there's the vertebral arteries coming up through those sides. That's one way in radiographically in cross sections to tell cervical vertebrae. And there is the suboccipital triangle where it ascends up through before going into the frame and magnum. And so here in this post, in the inferior view of the skull, there's the frame and magnum, and there's our vertebral arteries along with spinal accessory nerve and the spinal cord. And so as that vertebral artery ascends through the frame and magnum, it then supplies the posterior part of the brain as both vertebral arteries come together to make the basilar artery. So here's the vertebral artery, and it supplies the cere uh, cerebellum and the posterior part of the cerebrum vertebral artery. All right, the other branch is called the thyrocervical trunk. And in this anterior view, there's our right subclavian artery. And it's the same on both sides, but on the right, there's our thyrocervical trunk. And as its name implies, it supplies the, thi supplies the thyroid by the inferior thyroid artery. And as well in the cervical region, there's the transverse cervical artery and that goes across the posterior triangle and supplies the traps, levator, and rhomboids, and the suprascapular that also goes across the posterior triangle of the neck and supplies the shoulder. And the transverse cervical and suprascapular arteries provide a collateral circulation to the shoulder. So if you can actually pinch off the entire subclavian artery and still supply the upper limb. Um, now the subclavian artery courses between the anterior middle scalene muscles. And so there's the anterior and there's our middle scalene muscles. And there's the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus exiting between the two. But notice the subclavian vein is anterior to the anterior scalene muscle. Now let's go to the common carotid arteries. And so the common carotid artery also has an asymmetrical origin with the brachiocephalic trunk for the right common carotid and the aortic arch for the left common carotid. So the right common carotid comes off the brachiocephalic trunk like that. And the left common carotid arises from the aortic arch like that. And there is that asymmetrical origin for both common carotid arteries in the neck. And so the common carotid artery is located within the carotid sheath or cross section through the C6 uh, level of the uh, cervical spinal cord, cervical vertebrae, and there's our carotid sheath. And inside the carotid sheath is the common carotid artery, the internal jugular vein, and the vagus nerve. And so the carotid artery gives rise to the carotid pulse. And the carotid pulse occurs during systole, and that's when the common carotid artery expands, when the left ventricle contracts, forcing blood into the common carotid artery. If you palpate the common carotid artery, you can feel each pulsation, and as a result, you can determine and measure heart rate. And so if you palpate the side of the neck right by the laryngeal cartilage or the Adam's apple, you can feel that common carotid artery and determine heart rate. Now, the term common means to bifurcate. Whenever you see like common carotid, common iliac, common hepatic, whenever you see that prefix common, you know it's something's going to bifurcate or branch. And the term carotid means to sleep or stupor because if you occlude both carotids, you reduce oxygen levels to the brain and the person's going to faint. So let's go over those two branches of the common carotid artery. So here's our common carotid artery and the common means to bifurcate into an internal carotid and an external carotid artery. There they are. So let's now go to the internal carotid artery first with the carotid sinus and body. So the internal carotid artery is right there. And it 
has no branches in the neck, and it supplies the anterior part of the brain as well as the orbit and part of the forehead of the scalp. And so let's do this. Let's reduce this, flip it around, and let's put the brain on top of that. And we take the brain out. You notice that if I put a, a you know oblique line through the temporal lobe like that, it helps us to determine the blood supply to the brain. So there's our internal carotid artery, and watch. The internal carotid artery comes up and provides the anterior circulation to the brain. Now let's review now the vertebral artery again. The vertebral arteries come up, and they provide the posterior circulation of the brain. And so we see that the brain is supplied by two arteries, the internal carotid and the vertebral artery, which makes the vertebral basilar system. And so those two arteries are the major, major blood supply to the brain, and they all ascend up to the brain through the neck. Now, if the internal carotid artery is something called the carotid sinus, which has its origin on the internal carotid artery. So there's the internal carotid artery, and there's the carotid sinus. It gets its name because it's on the carotid, and it, it has an expansion. And so sinus means a space. Um, it's a baroreceptor, which means it senses changes in blood pressure. So think of a barometer, which senses changes in pressure in the atmosphere. A baroreceptor senses changes in blood pressure. And it's part of what's called the baroreflex. And so let's use this picture to show that. Well, there's our common carotid artery, which gives rise to the internal carotid artery and has its origin, has the carotid sinus, which is a baroreceptor and it senses changes in blood pressure. And let's say that there is a drop in blood pressure, you initiate something called the baroreflex, that the, uh, the cranial nerve 9 sends this information from the carotid sinus to the brainstem that says, hey, our blood pressure just dropped. We need to do something about it. So the brainstem does the following. It has a sympathetic discharge, which increases mean arterial pressure, increases heart rate, and affects the kidney, which then through the uh, renin uh, angiotensin aldosterone system helps to bring blood pressure back to normal. The brainstem also takes parasympathetic or vagal tone to reduce heart rate in this case, uh, to, uh, to reduce the vagal tone so that the heart rate can increase. Basically, the the carotid sinus initiates a chain of events with sympathetic and parasympathetic discharge until the carotid sinus senses blood pressure as being back to normal. All of that is initiated by that carotid sinus. Now, the carotid body is located between the internal and external carotid arteries. Internal, external carotid arteries, and there's the carotid body. This is a chemoreceptor because it senses changes in blood oxygen and blood carbon dioxide levels. All right, so now let's go to the external carotid artery and its associated branches. So there is the external carotid artery, and it supplies the neck and the face. Tons of branches off of that in the neck. And so the external carotid artery has the following branches. There's the superior thyroid, and there's the superior laryngeal artery. Let's do that one again through this anterior view. There's the thyroid gland, there's the larynx, and there's the external carotid artery, giving rise to the superior laryngeal artery and the superior thyroid artery, both uh, going off to the neck. Next is the lingual artery there, and as its name implies, goes to the tongue for lingual. There's this lateral view, the external carotid artery. There's the lingual artery going underneath the tongue, and it supplies the tongue there. Next is the facial artery there, and as its name implies, supplies the face. So there's our external carotid artery, and there's the facial artery, and all those branches going to the lower chin, the mouth, like the lips, going to the side of the nose and the orbit. And so in this lateral view, there's where the facial artery goes over the angle of the mandible, and if you palpate that, you can feel the facial pulse. Next is the ascending pharyngeal artery there, which is the smallest branch from the external carotid. It's going to go up and supply the pharyngeal constrictors and smaller branches that does the posterior part of the meninges. It's the smallest branch. Next is the occipital artery there. This doesn't show it very well in this picture, so let's do this one here from Gray's Anatomy. There's the occipital artery and supplying the back of the scalp. And so there's our stenocleidomastoid in the traps, and with those two muscles with the clavicle, make the posterior triangle of the neck. But if we subdivide that triangle with the omohyoid, we make what's called the occipital triangle, and it gets its name because the occipital artery in the apex names this triangle. Now, the posterior auricular here gets its name because it's the branch behind the ear. Posterior behind auricular ear. Supplies the back of the part of the scalp and behind the ear. Next is the maxillary artery. 
This is a big one. This is an important one. So there's the external carotid, and there's the maxillary artery, and this branch, it's right in the infratemporal fossa. It's huge. It supplies the meninges through the middle meningeal artery, muscles uh, like the deep temporal muscle for the temporalis, the masseteric for the masseter, the pterygoid branches. It supplies the orbit through the inferior orbital artery, the nasal cavity, the maxilla and maxillary teeth and gums, the palate. It's going to supply the mandibular teeth, the mandibular mandibular gums, mandibular skin, very important artery. And then the terminal branch of the external carotid is the superficial temporal artery. And as its name implies, it's superficial in the temporal region, supplies the scalp and face. And that, my friends, are all the arteries in the neck in a nutshell.